right, Michelle, first things first, before we even get into retirement, let's just talk about the beginning of this <laughs> executive director with the NBA PA uh, journey and how the opportunity interests you and how it came to be. So I wasn't looking for this, <laughs> right? I, I really need to underscore that because not only was I not looking for this, I, to save my soul, I would not have been able to say I would end up in sports. I, I've never played. Um, always been a basketball fan. You grow up in New York, it's hard not to, but never for one second thought I'd be in the world of sports. Um, so I, 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 I literally just fell into it. I, I, I was, um, in my old life, I was a trial lawyer. I tried cases that would typically last for many, many months at a time. And one of those cases settled, had some free time, a chance to read the newspaper, read about my predecessor being fired, thought, that's a cool job. I'm sure they'll fill it in seconds. And then some months later, I again, picked up the sports section and read that they were still looking. So I don't know what happened, but at that moment I began to Google, find out a little bit more about, about the business, about the circumstances leading up to his termination. And frankly, the more I read about it, the more I thought this would be so cool. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta try it, right? <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so I did. And you know, the rest is what they call history. Did you feel did you feel embraced right away as you stepped in? I know there's a lot of moving parts, and you, I mean, your experience. I know you've dealt with just about everything, but what were some of the interesting dynamics, or difficulties in terms of stepping into that role? Well, bear in mind, I stepped into an, a role where my predecessor had been fired, so there's already the suspicion about you know the utility of the union. Can we trust anyone? Should, do we need this thing? Um, and they made it very clear that the players, that is, made it very clear that, that I was going to have to earn their trust. And they weren't kidding. I had to earn their trust. <laughs> I, was, I was tested in ways that I think make absolute sense because, again, they had been, uh, they felt at least, I can't speak on the, the bona fides of their problems with my, with my predecessor, but they felt as if they'd been, they'd been burned. And so it's probably about two years in when I began to not see people look at me with a side eye, right? Um, and, but I, no, no complaints about it. I think that in any job you have to prove your worth, but I think when you come into a circumstance where there's been sort of bad blood and litigation and all that, then it's particularly important to earn the trust and the credibility. And it's worked out. No, we, one of the things we talk about appreciate you is just how, you know, representation mm -hmm. is so important um, as, a, as a black woman in this role. Um, what was that experience in terms of the feedback you would get from people and, and, and recognizing just how important, you know, um, that role is and uh, what it, the example that you set in terms of opportunities? No, if, if you, and you know players, so you, you, you will know something that many people did not understand about how in the hell I got this job, right? And I mean, they literally said, she's not in sports, she's a girl, and she's, and the, the black thing wasn't as much of an issue, but you know, she's a girl, <laughs> in sports, she's a lawyer, what does she know about this? Um, but one thing that if you know our players is you know that not all of them, but a good, a good number of them were raised by a single black woman, right? Who they all acknowledge saved their lives, right? I mean, they, who they acknowledge, they viewed as the most important person in their world um, and someone of incredible strength. And so these men had no difficulty appreciating that a woman can do important things. Heck, she saved my life, right? I mean, who doesn't remember uh, Katie's, you know, Hall of Fame, his speech when he won the MVP, right? I mean, so yeah. Yeah. in retrospect, it was not difficult for these men to say a woman can do this because they'd seen it and happened. They've seen themselves, themselves as an example. Um, and the more moms I met, the more I said, this was a piece of cake. And I, thank their, and I thank their moms because their moms demonstrated and proved to them, you know, women can, are capable um, and can do anything that a man can do. And so it wasn't that as big a lift as people might, might assume. Um, they, they got it before they, before they knew me. <laughs> who were, just for you, who were some big role models for you growing up a part of your journey? My mom. Right, and I also was raised by a single mom. My parents separated when I was very young. So my mom was absolutely saved my life. Um, she, you know, she was a very no-nonsense kind of woman who did not take kindly to the notion, well, mommy, we're poor. We're not supposed to, you know, right? 
So my mom, before, and then and then I've had, you know, oddly enough, m most of my role models were men. Um, and I think it's because of the profession I chose that just weren't a lot of women who would do, I mean, a lot more now, but there weren't a lot of women who were doing the kind of work I was doing. So, you know, the good news is I met some great men who you know, believed that I had talent and, 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 and sort of were available to help me get to the next level. Um, a lot of people were role models that didn't even know that I was modeling myself after them because they didn't know me, right? And so, you know, I had people who I've admired that are strangers to me. Some of them are younger than me. Um, in this job, I've had players who have inspired me in ways that they don't even know about. Um, I, I, don't know, I, I don't think it's a cookie cutter, cookie cutter kind of, kind of thing. You, know, you meet people, you read about people, and you say, I want to be like blank. And then you yeah. just try to do it. Could you give us a, a, a name or two of these people in, um, in, in the profession that you chose in, in entertainment and just in prominent, in different prominent roles? I, I, I will, um, someone you'll, don't, you won't know, someone I worked with, uh, this brother Charles Ogletree was, I, mean, I, worship, I still worship him. Um, he made me the best lawyer I could possibly be. He knew he was a role model though. <laughs> he didn't. <laughs> You know, I, I, as much as I love Barack, I, I think Michelle is, is spectacular, right? I, 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 I'm, 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 I met uh, President Obama many, not many times, three or four times, um, but I'm still waiting to meet Michelle, right? Because I think he was fantastic. But Stacey Ed, Ed, Edwards is now my, my, Abrams rather, is now my, my, my number one role model because of the work she did in Georgia. Um, Gosh, uh, you know, Harriet Tubman, who I've never met, obviously, but I, I know her story. I love her story. Maya Angelou. I mean, you know, a lot of Black women, they don't know me. <laughs> <laughs> but I love them. I, I want to be like them. Um, and, you know, th those, those are the shoulders upon which we all stand. And, you know, I, I, I guess the one person I wish I had met, and I obviously would never will because he, he, he's no longer with us, is Malcolm X. I think that was the first time that I began to appreciate that being an African American um, was not a it was not a problem. It was something to be proud of. And I mean, I read his book when I was probably ten, and, and I read it every year. I read it every year because he's oh. an inspiration. But you know, there we got we got plenty of heroes and sheroes out there. You know, as you mentioned I mentioned in other interviews that um, the autobiography of Malcolm X um, mm -hmm. was the most transformative book for me. And I didn't read it for the first time until I started college. And um, yeah, I, it took took that long and it opened my eyes and, and the things that you said in terms of, um, you know, taking pride um, in one's heritage, the color of your skin, where you come from, that whole thing. And, and, um, and shunning all those false narratives that people try to you know put upon you so um that's 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 a big one that, going through so much you talked about single parent household i did as well um you know being a trial lawyer you have a lot of things thrown at you except this executive director role with the nba and you you know you're thinking it's going to be one thing and then you deal with covid uh and then the, the the George Floyd situation and talking about pride and bringing up Malcolm X and some of the other names that you did also because Maya Angelou talked a lot about pride and there are so many others that set a great example. Mm -hmm. What was that experience like in your communication with the players and forming you know um, keeping the conversation going in terms of what's important and things that are bigger than the game um, and, and especially being a, in a sport that's predominantly black mm -hmm. and and being out at the forefront there. I actually began to get some hint about what the, 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 the I don't want to say political persuasion of the players were, but their, their commitment to community was even before I got the job. Uh, when when Donald, Donald Sterling was in the news, mm -hmm. uh, I was watching to see what the players were going to do. Um, I knew what I thought. I thought he needed to be drummed out of the league immediately. But I wanted to see, and I hadn't been, been hired yet, I wanted to see what these these guys are going to do. And I will recall, I do recall pretty clearly a, a, a media interview that Chris Paul, who was the president of the, uh, of the Players Association at the time and a member of the Clippers team, was asked about, you know, what, what are the players thinking about all this? And he said, and with a, with a seriousness that I'll never forget, uh, we're going to see what the league is going to do. And, and it, was, it wasn't a threat. 
but it was a promise, <laughs> right? That I heard, I had heard loudly and clearly, and I suspect Adam did as well, because it wasn't long after that that the league announced that that he was that Sterling was going to be banned. Um, and at that moment, I said, I want to work for these men because they're no nonsense, um, and they clearly had some authority that they were not. You know, I'm not going to poo-poo other other sports, but there are there are other sports that don't take seriously players' positions on the, some of these matters. Um, and so that happened, and then I got the job, and then you'll remember the ESPN interview, uh, the ESPN, I mean, the ESPYs, and I get a phone call the night, and I don't watch, I don't watch award shows, I just think they're ridiculous, <laughs> but I get this phone call saying, you watching the ESPYs tonight, and I said, no, and the caller said, I think you should, and I went, oh my god, what, what, and it opens with that fabulous scene with these four brothers standing up there, all wearing black, and it's a call to action. Yeah. And that's when I knew who these players were. I said, you know, these men are not simply taking the money and running. They, they actually care about their communities. And so when, when you know, when, when COVID hit and we were all at home and we were trying to get back to work and figuring out a way to do it safely. And then, you know, all of, I'm watching these brothers and these sisters because these basketball players, women basketball players ain't to be played with. I'm watching them as a community, and you know, they and I'm out there. I'm, I live in Harlem. I'm out there too. And I'm watching them, you know, with, with absolute pride. Um, and then we finally get the protocols ready, and we're deciding whether we go back. And the question was, should we go back to play? Are we distracting from this unbelievably necessary national conversation? And I'll tell you, Michael, I was on probably 40 calls with players. Some of them all you know, full team. Some of them just, and it was fascinating. It was absolutely fascinating. The consensus was, if we go back, we're not going to go back and give people a distraction from this mm -hmm. conversation. We're going to put it right in their faces. And so Black Lives Matter is all over the court, right? Guys are wearing slogans on their, on their, on their uniforms. Uh, we're doing, when the press conferences begin by, say her name, Brianna Taylor. Yeah. It, was, it was phenomenal. And we exact some, some concessions. I don't want to say concessions because the league will say, no, we agreed with you. But we made some agreements with the league and the teams about how they would facilitate this discussion and, and at that time help get the vote out. Um, and then, you know, when, when Jacob Blake was shot and we were in the bubble and, and once again, we're stopping. Mm -hmm. That a meeting that took hours that night with over 200 players. Again, I, you know, I, I, I regret that not everybody in the world could have seen this because it was just fascinating to watch these men talk about what they were going to do and what what the league was going to do and what the teams were going to do um and and argue and and, and hug and fight and cry but all in love for their communities um, black and white by the way mm. um, international and and, and and american players so um, i may be ashamed of many things that i've done in life not many <laughs> um, but few, they're, they're are also some things I'm really proud that I've done in life. And one of them is had been blessed with the opportunity to work with these men. How can the, the NBA players involved um, continue to show their support for the efforts to, you know, um, make a America better, um, league more uh, inclusive um, and, and keep that conversation going in terms of, of what's right and, and continuing to be a voice uh, for the community? They, they can they do it in ways that most people don't even know about. I mean, obviously they 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 put a lot of their own personal personal treasure into the community. We 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 built so many community centers, and I mean by we I mean the players have. It's not just AAU basketball. I mean they're doing things for you know, in, 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 in in neighborhoods that have you know, horrible health care, food deserts. Um, the education, STEM. I mean, it, it, it is amazing if you look at the, the range of things that the players invest their own, their own resources. Water, clean water in Africa, right? Africa is just extraordinary. So they do a lot that, that, that don't make the headlines, but they also use their platforms when, when it's appropriate um, to um, remind people that you may think of me as a basketball player, and I am, uh, but I'm also a man, I'm an American, I'm a member of this community. And so, you know, whenever I've asked them or they've been asked to, for example, do a panel, we, uh, what's his name? Tobias Harris just did a panel for the uh, Congressional Black Caucus on athlete activism. I mean, th th that's not gonna be headline news, but it's gonna be part of the, 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 the Black Caucus's conversation about what they can do. 
that we are trying to do more about some of these ridiculous voting restrictions that are being passed in, in states. Um, and we are going to do continue to do more about that. So you know, whenever I mean, they do have day jobs, and so I, you know, they're not, they're not they're not community activists. I'm not. You're not, right? We do have to, you know, to, to make a living. And they are fathers, and they are husbands, and they are sons, and so they have to have time for their families. But I'm I'm consistently impressed with their willingness to be a part of the conversation, and if things get quiet, to start things up again. Um, and so I think we're going to see them. I mean, again, quietly, so much is being done behind the scenes. Their support of Black businesses is, is incredible. Their investment in the Black community in real estate for, for affordable housing is incredible. Um, but when it's time to hit the streets, they hit the streets too. They are remarkable. Okay. They are. They, the, the last thing on this um, this subject real quick. It, it's, it is unfortunate that there was, uh, you know, a tragedy um, you know, led to so many of these conversations and so many, you know, speaking out. Some players have had no issue throughout their career right. speaking out on, on a variety of issues. But how much pride did you take? I, I know I certainly did in watching guys with the Brooklyn Nets mm -hmm. who um, I didn't pin as, as the vocal type, mm -hmm. um, but being so, you know, feeling the conviction to mm -hmm. speak up and, and, and find their voice and to step up. And, and you mentioned how many guys were on these calls and how many people were out in the streets and a part of these protests and, and seeing guys who, um, well, I, I didn't, I didn't, you know, I, I didn't peg him as someone that, that would speak up or be at the forefront of the front lines. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought that was really beautiful to see. Not only the guys who you expect, mm -hmm. but other guys who felt convicted to step up as well. Yeah, and especially during those calls, and that's why I say it's unfortunate that you guys couldn't have been at this meeting. I, I was like eating popcorn and saying, wow, <laughs> right? So I never knew you had that, and just incredible. Um, because you know, bear in mind, those of us, so many of us, too many of us in our community, we do well financially, and then we disappear, right? Okay. They could, and it's not. You don't have to do. I'm a Christian, so I'm, I think you're supposed to do things for your, you know, your fellow man and woman. Um, but you don't have to. It's not. It's not a law. And the fact that these guys don't simply take the money and run, but instead believe that they have to pay it forward and pay it back. And do it, do it with relish. They're not burdened by it. You know, they're burdened by racism. They're not burdened by having to fight it. They're burdened by racism and classism, all the things that 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 are I mean, render life for some of us um, and unfortunately and unequal. But they are, they are, they are unapologetic in their resistance to oppression. Unapologetic. Um, and it, and it, it permeates everything they do, by the way. It's not something that they are, they, 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 they roar when they want to. Why is now the right time to retire, Michelle? <laughs> because because I, I promised myself that I would not die behind a desk. I just, I, I did that a long time ago. I said, you know, you, you love your work. And I do. I, I've, I've always been blessed with having, you know, doing work that I, that truly inspired me to get up in the morning. But I knew the danger of, of that. I said, you know, you, you are, have consistently been making a list of all the things you wanna do when you have time and you never have time. So if, 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 if God is good and you have your health at 65, and I'm not ashamed to say I'll be 65 soon, you <laughs> stop, what, right, stop what you're doing and, 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 and just smell the damn roses. And, <laughs> That's why it's time, not because I, I dislike the job. I, I love this job, but I, you know, I've been working since I was 13. Yeah. yeah. Oof. Okay. <laughs> you work early, early and often since I was 13. <laughs> I think I think I kind of deserve to take some time off. You deserve and it. And I've got friends who are retired and they're like, girl, you need to get on, get on this water. It feels good. <laughs> <laughs> So you're gonna you're gonna find the nearest boat. You're gonna find me I'm gonna, on I'm the gonna, beach. I'm gonna find beaches. I want to do. I mean, I do a lot of traveling, but it's always business related. I never have time to just sort of get to know the, the, you know, the community. And I, I haven't had a vacation. I don't remember the last time I had a vacation. But I'm gonna I'm gonna still do some work. I'm not gonna have a paycheck, right? Because I've, I've I've also sacrificed such that my retirement is taken care of. I'll do a little work. I, I want to get back to some of the things I think are important in the community. I'm still passionate about criminal justice issues, and I want to do some work on that. A little, a little board work here and there. But ultimately, when I get up in the morning, I'm going to say, 
So what do you want to do today? <laughs> Not what do you do today, but what do you want to do today? I saw this headline, which I really think is cool because so many players have played ball on this court, including Kevin Durant of the uh, the Brooklyn Nets, Rucker Park, and uh, the uh, the Players Association and their role in and um, and and breathe a new life in, into the Rucker. Yeah, I'm so excited about that. The, the, the Rucker, I grew up in, in the South Bronx, uh, two older brothers, both of whom were passionate about basketball, both of whom thought they'd play in the NBA, neither of whom had any talent whatsoever. So <laughs> <laughs> of course they never, never got anywhere close to the league. Um, but you know, they, they play basketball. Every kid in the projects I grew up with, every boy, young boy played, played basketball. And the Rucker was, was like special. And they, they, I don't think they ever got to play in even a tournament. They weren't that good, but they always went to the Rucker every every summer for whatever tournament. And they were supposed to be babysitting me, right? And my mom didn't know this, but they took me to Harlem. <laughs> and so I grew up not, not so much watching the games, but watching the excitement surrounding the game. Um, and so the Rucker has always been special to me as a New Yorker and as a basketball fan. And the first time I went, to, went back to the Rucker after I got the job, I was mortified at the condition of the court. Um, and there were efforts being made to, to get the court ready for different games. But I thought, you know, we don't treat, we don't treat, you know, this is a sanctuary like that. You know, this is a sanctuary. So we're just talking to some of the guys about it. Um, and I, you know, we've got great places. We've got Drew and, and, and all these lovely basketball meccas, but the Rucker, the Rucker has to be respected. And so we, we decided to, breathe some new life into the Rucker. Uh, construction is going on right now. We expect that we'll be able to reopen the park first week of October. And I, it will be such a glorious day to see. We're hoping to bring a lot of guys back, including including Kai and Kevin. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> and these guys that, that, that grew up and, and played at the Rucker. Um, when I have them come back and, and just give the give Harlem just, just say thank you to Harlem and Harlem basketball because it's done, you know, it's done, we've done well by the Rucker. And Michelle, thank you so much for the, your time. Thank you for all that you've done for the league and representing. And uh, so good to talk to you. Thanks you. Thank you so much. And uh, all the best as you do what you want to do each and every day. <laughs> and by, by, by the way, uh, I think the work you do is pretty darn good too. I've always enjoyed your interviews. I don't do many of these things. And so it's only because of the quality of your work, Michael. Keep it up. Oh, th thank you so much. Thank you so much, Michelle. I appreciate you.